from here, I'm going to branch off back to that microbial side that we looked at earlier. And uh, I will credit the University of Illinois a lot. The uh, microbial data, the microbial sequencing, uh, they put a lot of time and effort in. Uh, but we did have a postdoc here at Iowa State University fan who took some of that data and worked with it a little bit differently, trying to connect the microbes to different functional things we saw in the manure. So I'm going to go through some of the data that uh, she came up with. I think it's uh, interesting. I will say I'm not a microbiologist. Uh, she is a much better one than me, so I hope I can do this justice. So micro methane production in uh, microbial systems is really unique because it's not just one organism that causes it. It's really a bunch of steps to go from either the protein, the fat, or the carbohydrate all the way down to methane. So it really is a community. And that makes things a lot more interesting because one microbe has to be connected to another and how they connect is super important for how the ultimate system might end up. So a little bit on what they did. I talked to you a little bit earlier about those designations of the manure anywhere from the A level, which would have been either the foam itself or potentially a crust, but generally the foam itself all the way down through that sludge. Uh, so they took microbial samples from all these layers, uh, had the feed inputs that producers were uh, feeding in those barns at any given time, and, and along with 31 of the physical measurements that we took and tried to create interrelations between them. All right, so now the fun part, time for the data. So earlier we looked at the microbial community graph, and this graph is essentially showing the same thing. Again, the axes are uh, non-dimensional, but two points that are close together would tend to have microbial communities that are very similar, both in the types of bacteria that are present, as well as the amount of each type that are present. Uh, points that are further apart would tend to be much more different. So when you look at this graph, those green shapes, uh, those would represent consistently foaming barns. Uh, the gray symbols there, the circles, would represent consistently non-foaming barns. And the first thing that we can notice pretty clearly is that there does appear to be a difference in how they cluster, right? Foaming barns tend to cluster in one area, non-foaming barns tend to cluster somewhere else, and that would mean there's differences in the microbial community. On this graph, uh, you can see that they did list some bacteria or different types of bacteria on that graph. Uh, here you can see lactobacillus, uh, over here bacteroides, uh, and oftentimes you'll see some of these unclassified bacteroidales. So those, ten, those are supposed to exhibit uh, that if we were over here on the graph, we would tend to be higher in bacteroides of this type. Uh, unfortunately, on the unclassified, we can't learn much about them, but some of the ones that we could get names in class for, they do tell us something about what those manure samples generally look like. All right, so we know there's some differences in the microbial communities, uh, but can we relate that to anything? So on this graph, there's a lot going on. So this is sampled based on 16S RNA, which is basically all types of microbes in the manure. And then on the uh, gray bar here, we're showing the methane production rate, uh, sort of how it varied. So the dark gray lines would mean higher methane production, uh, lighter in color would mean lower methane production. And here you'd be looking at any purple dot would represent one manure sample from a foaming barn. Uh, any green dot would represent a manure sample from a non-foaming barn. And then uh, those orange symbols would represent manure samples from a barn that was crusted when we sampled it. And we did break out crust uh, separately for a couple different reasons. Uh, I'll try and hit on them in just a little bit here. Uh, the circles that they drew on this graph would represent uh, where the centroid of that microbial community is thought to exist. So really, if you see circles that don't, don't overlap, they would be different communities. Uh, all our circles do overlap, but you can see a pretty good difference between the foaming barns from the non-foaming barns. Uh, they're clustering to different areas. Crust itself was interesting because it overlaps both circles pretty greatly. And just by looking at the symbols, you can sort of see that. Um, our experience from sampling was barns that had crust on them were often in a state of transition, either from uh, not foaming to foaming or from foaming to not foaming. Uh, so I think the data sort of points that out. At times they'd have a community that resembled that of non-foaming manures. At other times they would have communities that resembled foaming manures, depending on where they were in that state. Uh, over on the right-hand graph here, again, you're looking at, at axes that are 
non-dimensionally scaled, so the same thing. But in this time, we were focusing specifically on the MCRA gene, and that is a gene tied heavily to methane production. So earlier I had showed you that uh, foaming manures and non-foaming manures had essentially the same methanogen populations. Uh, but what this graph shows is that, is that there's different types of methanogens in those manures. And in this case, what we saw was that the methanogen community in foaming manures was tied very strongly to higher rates of methane production. Now you might be saying, well, we should capture these microbes and uh, throw them in an anaerobic digester. And while that sounds great, uh, I will caution that the majority of the methanogen population over here, about 50% of it was of un unknown methanogen type. So we really just don't know much about them, uh, which makes even cultivating them relatively difficult. All right, now the fun part of this. I mentioned earlier that uh, we we're gonna try and relate this to uh, different variables that we measured. And the way they explain this to me is it's sort of like playing seven degrees of separation from Kevin Bacon, right? Uh, so um, if you've played the game before, uh, you're given an actor and you try and connect him how he gets to Kevin Bacon. Essentially, we're gonna play the same game in a microbial community. Uh, so try and draw these connections from one person to the next person until you can finally get to your final player. All right, so the graphs that they make when they do these are sort of cluster graphs. And you can see that there's lots of different bacteria types listed there. Uh, since I'm not a microbiologist, I'm not going to read all of them. They have some interesting names. In some cases, they're classified and we can learn something about them. In some cases, they're of an unclassified type. Uh, and then we know a little bit less about them. Uh, but what you can see is that we, they drew lines between these bacteria and form clusters. So if there is a line connecting them, that means when we saw higher levels of one in one barn, we tended to see higher levels of a second one with it. Uh, so they were correlated somehow. The big difference here is we saw vastly different clusters forming in non-foaming manures and foaming manures. In the non-foaming manures, most of those interactions were with different types of, of firmicutes. In the foaming barns, most of the interactions tended to be uh, with bacteroides, proteobacteria, and still some firmicutes. Now, I see firmicutes on there twice, and to me that was the same thing. Uh, my microbiologist tells me that that's the same thing at a genus level, but not at a species level. So there's differences between those types of firmicutes. The more interesting part was they started to draw some of these bacteria and relate them to some of the things we measured. Uh, so if you look at the non-foaming barn, they would have here like bacteria related to short chain fatty acids. So somehow that bacilli, when its population changes, it's correlated to chains in short chain fatty acids that are acetic acid. Uh, in the foaming barns, we saw a much different sort of chain. Uh, mostly that clostridia was related to long chain fatty acids and that breakdown path uh, might be important to us. Another way to look at this is sort of just looking at what variables were correlated to each other and whether that correlation was uh, positive or negative. So I think here on the, the right side of this graph, you can see a few things that they were pointing out to us. Uh, mostly that uh, in our foaming manures, our correlations tended to be chemical to chemical type correlations, right? So carbon was correlated to things. Uh, to me, that implies that if these things were there, our bacteria had a method of breaking them down. On the other hand, in our uh, crusting barns, we tended to have some things like surface tension, a physical parameter that was correlated to chemical parameters, uh, like, uh, either uh, something in the diet or maybe just a soluble compound that was being fed. Whereas when in our non-foaming barns, almost all those correlations tended to be physical type correlations. The one thing that really stood out to us here uh, from our microbial data was lactobacillus. It tended to not be present in our foaming barns and that bacteria was present in our non-foaming barns at relatively higher levels. And it, may be important because lactobacillus is well known for making proteases that hopefully break down proteins. And we had found that that protein was important for the emulsion of foam that we were uh, storing.